Hi, welcome to the Signal Pad. In this episode, we're going to try to stump the 5G experts from Keysight. There's actually a new contest on Keysight's website, all the links are in the video description, where they're asking people to submit a challenge or a puzzle in the 5G test and measurement ecosystem to see if we can stump their 5G experts, essentially coming up with a problem that they would not be able to solve. And if you do that, there are some prizes actually involved in being able to stump the experts there. So I thought that, hey, we have some equipment back here, which are all 5G compatible and related. In fact, these are the industry standard equipment used for 5G testing from Keysight, and we can try and see if we can come up with an experiment to confuse them. And if you know the answer to the problem, once you see it, don't help them. Let me see if they can figure it out themselves. Again, I'm sure they can figure it out. They are, after all, designed all these equipment and all these test and measurement sequences anyway. But just for the viewers, at the end of the video, I also have another little puzzle with the test and measurement. You can see if you can solve that one. So let's get started. Okay, let's take a look at our setup and see what instrument is connected where. Here on the left side, we have a Keysight AXIE chassis with a built-in embedded controller, as well as an M8190A, which is a dual channel, 12 giga sample per second, 12-bit arbitrary waveform generator with a built-in digital up conversion into the A6 of the DAX. This is a, almost an ideal 5G waveform generator, probably one of the industry's best in terms of linearity and bandwidth, which you can do with this, which is exactly what we're going to use it for in this experiment. On the right side, we have a Keysight MXR 608A, which is a 16 giga sample per second, 6 gigahertz, 8 channel oscilloscope. I've done a full teardown and review of this instrument as well. And because it has completely independent acquisition board for each individual channel, we basically can do a, a huge amount of computation with the VSA software that this is compatible with. This also has digital down conversion built into it as well, which you can do 2 gigahertz of instantaneous analysis on the VSA too. So when you have eight channels connected to the VSA, you can do MIMO, you can do a lot of computation in the back end. We'll take a look at that here. In this case, we're only really using one of the channels, but nonetheless, that's of course possible. Now for our device under test, I have that right over here. Since we're generating I and Q differential signals, we also have an up converter right over here. This up converter will then use an LO signal, which is coming from this battery powered synthesizer in order to up convert that to 2.6 gigahertz. And the RF output of that is directly going onto our oscilloscope. So what do we expect? Well, we expect the IQ signal from the M8190A to be up converted using our modulator and appear as an RF carrier with the modulation directly in the Keysight MXR. So using the VSA, we should be able to demodulate that and get our constellation. But there's a problem in this setup. I want to see if we can figure out what that problem is. Let's jump to the VSA and see the constellation. All right, so here we are in the VSA software and we can already see a rough constellation. Let's take a look at the setup here just so we understand what kind of constellation we're looking at. We're looking at a 16 quam constellation at 100 mega symbols per second. And we're also looking at 512 symbols at a time. That's the record length that the VSA is using to make all these plots for us. That number is going to become important in just a moment. Now, if I look at this constellation, the occupied bandwidth at about 112 megahertz makes sense because we're using a particular pulse shaping that gives us this kind of occupied bandwidth for this type of symbol rate. Now these dots of points in the constellation look a bit fuzzy and it's possible that a lot of that is due to ISI. That means that the particular EVM error that we see here, and EVM error is quite high, move this over here, if you look at the EVM versus symbol, but if you also see the EVM number percentage RMS, it's about 9%, which is really high. And that could be because of ISI, which is all deterministic. We should be able to get rid of that using equalization. So we're going to go under compensate over here. I'm going to turn on the equalization. I'm going to let the equalization run. As soon as I do that, we can see that the instrument tries to equalize the channel and the dots in the constellation begin to coalesce into single points and the EVM will improve drastically. So we're going to let this run for a bit until it stabilizes, then I'm going to pause it. Look at that, the EVM is already at around 2.5%, considerably better than it was before and it's going to probably hit less than 2% if you wait long enough. But anyway, this is good enough. I'm going to put this on hold. So now we have stored in memory, this equalized channel. This is a frequency response, and this is coming from our modulator. It means that the modulator doesn't have enough bandwidth. So, so far, everything looks great. There is no problem. But here's the actual problem and the puzzle that I'm trying to see if we can figure out. If I go over here, and instead of looking at 512 symbols, I look at the longer record length, let's say 4096, which is quite a bit more. There it is. And okay, click OK. Now we can see that it is now really very different. We all of a sudden have this huge variation in EVM as a function of time. The constellation looks like an absolute mess, but 
I haven't changed anything. All I changed was looking at the duration of the sigma, nothing more. And of course, that duration initially of 512 symbol, I mean, that's random. It randomly hits different points in time. There is no synchronization here. So what is happening? Why do we see this EVM variation the way we do? What is happening with the constellation? And what is the likely place I need to go and look at to try and address this problem? This is a fairly tricky, but I have a feeling that the Keysight engineers, of course, will figure this out right away. But I'm curious to see what they think. All right, so here's the second puzzle for the viewers. Here on the left side, we have a Keysight E5071C. This is an ENA series network analyzer. This one goes from 300 kilohertz to 20 gigahertz. It's already been calibrated using an electronic calibration module, and I have port 1 and port 2 connected to that instrument all the way on the right. Now, this instrument has already been in one of my previous videos. This is a YIG tuned filter. We modified it such that we can adjust the center frequency of the YIG filter using this knob. So instead of it being controlled via the back, it's now controlled just simply with a potentiometer in the front. I can tune the center frequency of this YIG filter anywhere from about 2 GHz all the way to 18 GHz by just rotating this. Therefore, what we expect to measure is the band pass response of the YIG filter directly on the network analyzer. And as I adjust the knob, you expect the center frequency to shift the left and right along the axis here. But there's something wrong with this measurement. The measurement isn't quite what we're expecting. Now, again, there is no trickery involved here. All the cables, all the connectors, and all the instruments are fully functional. There's something else wrong in the way we're doing this measurement. Let's take a close look at this so we can see what the problem actually is. All right, so here we go. So the gig is set at around 5.76 gigahertz right now. And if you look at this cursor over here, it is indeed sitting at around 5.8 gigahertz and is reporting an S21 of minus 6 dB roughly. This, this is true, this uh, particular YIG filter does have an insertion loss of about 6 dB across the band. But look what happens when I try to increase the frequency here. Look, I'm going to slowly go forward. Look at that. What is happening over here? And if I keep going, it's just going to continue doing this over and over again throughout the entire band. It has this periodic response. Now, you may be tempted to say, well, this is obviously a broken connector. Potentially, you have maybe an open or a short somewhere, and the impedance of the line is constantly rotating around the smith chart, and we get this uh, kind of resonance effects uh, throughout the band. But that's not the problem. As I said earlier, the cables and the connectors are perfect. Something else is going on. Let me show you everything else just to make sure you see the settings. Here we go. You can see we're going from essentially from 300 kilohertz all the way to 20 gigahertz. And look at the sweep setup over here. We have 201 points linear frequency. There's no sweep delay or anything in there. So everything is really set up nicely. It's perfectly calibrated. There is absolutely nothing wrong with the instrument or with the filter. So what's the problem? And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this quick little video about the Keysight contest that's going on. Again, check out in the description. All the information is there. And of course, submit your own video. And if you have figured out the puzzle at the end, let me know in the comment section. I'm really eager to see uh, what the interesting discussions would be coming out of this video. I'll see you next time.